GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. Hey guys, I'm Felissa Rose Angela from Sleepaway Camp, and you're listening to the All Bets Are Off with a Robbie Vegas podcast. What's up, Rock Soldiers, and welcome back to the All Bets Are Off podcast. I'm your host, the rock star, Robbie Vegas, as always, and today we have Bill Randolph on the show. That name sounds very familiar to our horror listeners because Bill is in Friday the 13th Part 2, so we're going to be talking a lot of horror today, and uh, I won't spoil anything. I always let our guests do most of the talking when it comes to that, so... I do want you guys to know that uh, before we get Bill on the phone here, that this episode is presented by Away Travel. Quite simply, Away makes everything you need for a trip away. Away started with a perfect suitcase and built from there, creating a range of travel standards developed from the travel stories of friends and seatmates. The pieces aren't smart, they're thoughtful, with features that solve real travel problems. To give the whole world access to better travel standards, Away took the direct-to-consumer approach to lower prices and the quality is guaranteed. Your Away suitcase will be with you for life. We're teaming up with Away and Podgo to give you the best deal on premium luggage by going to podgo.co slash away. That's podgo.co slash away. Away travel, here to make your journey seamless. That's especially useful to our wrestlers who listen to the show because you need some good luggage when you're going from show to show, town to town. So make sure you guys check that out and they are a sponsor of the show. So of course it helps us out as well. Let's not waste any time. Let's get Bill on the phone and let's talk some Friday the 13th part two, which was voted by our listeners in the horror community as their favorite Friday the 13th movie uh, for the most part. So let's get him on the phone and see what he has to say. So, Bill, the first thing I want to do is just thank you for being here. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun for me because I'm a big fan of uh, Friday the 13th. So, thank you. My pleasure. So, I kind of want to take it back as far as you can remember and tell me how old you were when you started to develop like a love for acting and realize it was something you might want to do. Uh, well, it, it was uh, when I was a junior in high school. So, I don't know. How old is that? I guess that's 16. Is there a certain thing that uh, brought that, you know, out of you where you, you saw a certain movie or a certain thing on TV that you were like, yeah, that's what I want to do? Um, I, you know, that's interesting because my family lived in Europe um, from uh, fifth grade to tenth when I was in fifth grade to tenth grade. And so we didn't watch television at all. And certainly because we were living in France and Germany, uh, did not go to movies. I didn't really get back to film and movies until we then moved to California when I was in 10th grade. And my high school actually had a very active theater program, and they did a production of, um, and of course now I'm blanking on it. <laughs> <laughs> but they, I went and saw you know, a production that they were doing of The Fantastics. And it was it was so cool and it was so fun and uh, you know it just kind of sparked a, a, an interest in getting involved you know in theater in high school mm -hmm. and then the following year they were having auditions for George M and my uh, social studies teachers teacher Mrs Frolick I actually remember her name <laughs> said. said there's an audition this afternoon for um, George M, you know, and said to the class, you know, why don't you try it? Who knows? It might change your life. And that's exactly what happened. I went and I auditioned. I got in and it changed my life. Oh, wow. OK, cool. So now was your first big role in uh, was that in Dress to Kill? Actually, uh, you know, I was doing Dress to Kill, but at the time I was in a Broadway production called Gemini. And um, so I had already worked quite a bit as an actor and was already in the Actors' Equity Association. I was already in the union. And I, I you know, so casting directors in New York 
knew who I was or certainly started to know who I was. Mm -hmm. And Meg Simon and Fran Cuman were um, uh, auditioning for Friday the 13th Part 2. And uh, through them, you know, I got introduced to the whole gang and was fortunate enough to get into the movie. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you weren't really um, seeing a lot of movies from like 5th to 10th grade because uh, you were living in Europe. Now, when you did come back to California, were you already a fan of the genre of horror? Or was the introduction being in Friday the 13th Part 2? Yeah, actually, to be honest, you know, it kind of surprises me because you look now, you know, and, and dress to kill in some on some, you know, like Wikipedia or different places actually identifies it as a horror film. I never thought it was a horror film. So Friday the 13th really was kind of my introduction to horror films. And because I was, um, you know, being cast in part two, I went and saw part one. And, you know, certainly I play Kevin Bacon's clone in part <laughs> two. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, Kevin and I knew each other from, uh, you know, the, the uh, New York theater scene. In fact, um, you know, there was a bowling alley uh, between uh, like 77th Street and uh, Amsterdam Avenue on the Upper West Side. And as a group of actors, young actors, we used to go bowling all the time. So, <laughs> so I, knew, I knew Kevin from bowling and from a variety of, of mutual female acquaintances and things like that. So, yeah, I was pretty much introduced to horror films because of that. Now, then, <laughs> what, did they purposely like want you to kind of look like Kevin Bacon in the second one, or, or was that just you I guys am, naturally did? Well, I, you know, you would like to think, no, I'm so original that they just said, you know, who cares? Let's, let's go with it. But, <laughs> you know, uh, certainly... I'm sure that they had it in mind that they were trying to capitalize on the success of the first one, and they made it so quickly after uh, the first one that I'm sure that it didn't hurt that <laughs> Kevin and I had similarities. Right, of course. <laughs> so you get the you know cast in the in the film, and so now you're kind of new to the genre as far as watching it, and now you're involved in it. So what was it like on set? Where was it like an eerie feeling for you, or were you just kind of like going with the flow? Or do you remember what was going through your mind? Oh yeah, let me tell you. I, you know the thing that was great was, and I I know that it wasn't exactly the same for the uh, uh, the set of the you know the first of Friday the Thirteenth, but with us. We did not film on the same lake, even though you're supposed to believe that it's the same place, you know, a few years later. Mm -hmm. But we filmed, there were two camps that were on this lake that we filmed. And the first camp was a Boy Scout camp, which is where all the crew and the cast and everybody stayed and, you know, would come after filming and, you know, sleep and eat and drink and whatever. And then about, I don't know, a mile or so on the other side of the lake, we would bus, you know, or drive to this other side of the lake. And there was another camp, which is what we used essentially for the uh, entire set, except for Jason's lair, which they built in the middle of the woods somewhere. And also, uh, you know, we did go on location to the bar that one night and, you know, driving, in fact, where where we meet Ted, uh, Stu Charno, mm -hmm. in that little, that little city, that little town, that was, I don't know, maybe 10 miles from uh, the, uh, uh, the lake where we were actually filming. But, you know, other than that, everything was, uh, once, once we were up at the lakes, we pretty much were there the whole time. And I, it, it was a blast. I, you know, it was like, you know, being in uh, summer camp, we had uh, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Now, we had Lauren Marie Taylor on the show a few months back, and she was telling yeah. us how during the filming, she was actually terrified because uh, people were playing like pranks on her. Were you one of those people? <laughs> she didn't identify us. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, it was me and Stu Charno. We actually terrified uh 
yeah, we we would anybody that was susceptible, anybody that would fall for it, we would, <laughs> you know, certainly. Marta, Marta was a little too cool. Marta, I don't think, you know, she she knew it was us immediately. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Kirsten and and, and Lauren Marie, they fell for it hook, line, and sinker. We would we would sneak around the, uh, you know, their back windows on their uh, uh, cabins. And, you know, scratch the screen. <laughs> yes, she did tell us that story. That's right. <laughs> so did it ever backfire on you and you were like scaring everybody else? And then, you know, it was nighttime and you just finished like your death scene or something. And you were like, I'm kind of freaked out now, too. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really re- no. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know. I mean, certainly the thing is, is that um, and even though there was, you know, kind of a lot of ambient light at the camp where we were filming there was light all over the place at the camp that we were staying um in fact you know when you would you would want to sleep all day and uh because you'd be filming all night Mm -hmm. and you know it got to the point where you you know you'd be uh, taping anything over the windows just so you could get some darkness to go to sleep Oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, you mentioned that you guys were having a good time and you're playing pranks and all that. So was it hard for you to get into mode uh, when filming started to actually be scared? Like, how did you flip that switch? Because it sounded like you were having a blast. You know, I tell you, it's amazing, you know, just in terms of the imagination. And, and certainly with Marta and I, we were both we were inside. So, uh, you know, we didn't have, you know, it wasn't dark, it wasn't scary, it wasn't ever. And in fact, I didn't even know it was coming. Oh, okay. And even though we took walks, you know, in the beginning of the film, you know, down all these paths and whatever, you know, Marta, Sandra uh, wanted to convince me that, you know, it was pretty creepy. And for the most part, I just wouldn't buy it. So I don't think I was really, I don't think that really happened. And and certainly it, the thing about all the special effects is that they're so cool and they're so technical and, uh, you know, that just uh, the nuts and bolts of it were a lot of fun for me. So, so I didn't get creeped out as much as I was just fascinated by, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the execution of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. So, When it came time for filming death scenes and things like that, you were more so just, you know, interested in how it was going to work and what it was going to look like. Yeah. It's funny because essentially, and and unfortunately, I mean, now with the the last Blu-ray set, you actually do see uh, Sandra and my, uh, our death film, the way that it was filmed and the way that Carl Fullerton set it up. Mm -hmm. And that's, but uh, up until that point, you know, we had never seen I had never seen it on film. I don't. I don't know if anybody other than Carl Fullerton had ever seen it the way that they originally were planning on putting it in the film. Because oh, okay. uh, by the time it came out in '81, uh, the ratings board had cut it so much that you know Sandra reacts to the spear, and then it's through the bottom of the bed. Right. So you don't actually see it penetrate either of us, and. The special effect that Carl Fullerton set up, you see it go yeah. through the back. It's it's really a pretty cool uh, effect. So do you remember, you know, speaking of the newest release, do you remember actually seeing it for the first time in theaters yourself and, and just seeing it all put together and what was going through your head at that point? Yeah, I mean, I, it, we, we were very lucky, you know, uh, Paramount set up a screening for the New York actors and their agents and whatever, so that they could send Fran and, and uh, Simon, uh, Fran Cuman and, and Meg Simon were at the screening and whatever. So that was pretty tame. And, you know, everybody, you know, because they're in the industry was, you know, real cool and everything. But I actually was able to head out to, uh, a, a, you know, like a multiplex, a cineplex in New Jersey and see it with a live audience. And that was really fun. I mean, that was terrific. I mean, that, that it was much more effective in a dark theater with a bunch of uh, uh, fans than it was in a screening room with a bunch of, uh, you know, industry snobs. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that because now you're seeing what the actual reaction to the to the movie is from just normal people who are just going because they like to be scared and you're seeing them in the moment or hearing them. And that had to be really cool to just be sitting there taking that in. 
Oh, it was fantastic. And then, of and course, they thought you were Kevin Bacon. And... <laughs> <laughs> yes, so nobody bothered me. <laughs> By that point, you know, oh, nobody wants to talk to Kevin Bacon. He's a big star. <laughs> no, but it was funny because, you, you know, me with my ego, I'm th- thinking that I'm going to be mobbed after the film. And really, nobody paid attention. I don't think I don't think anybody. You know, of course, I didn't have the hat on, and and uh, you know, who knows? You know, but but uh, nobody even recognized me, which you know was pretty <laughs> disappointing at the time. Well, I mean, nobody expected a camp counselor to be there at the movie. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you you mentioned that that was your introduction to horror. So, are you still a fan of horror movies now, or did you kind of let that go with just being in the in the movie? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because I'm I'm not a horror fan where I constantly am looking for horror films, but certainly I think that the genre has matured and improved so much that now, you know, when you see uh, and, and you know they're like a listing horror films or whatever that it's it's so much scarier and uh, than than you know what we you know because you look back at both Fred, the first Friday the Thirteenth and Part Two they're really tame by today's standards and you know and I also think that psychologically films are built up much more uh, you know more more complicated it's not as simple as it was when with Friday the Thirteenth both Part One and Part Two were pretty straightforward you have sex you die (laughs) yeah right which set the standard for you know x amount of movies after that but at the same time there's an even bigger following now for friday the 13th than ever before and we actually ran a poll on our our podcast uh social media and everybody voted part two as their favorite one so yeah so being on the inside of that um did you see this increasing over time or was that something that just kind of like caught you off guard that wow these movies are suddenly bigger than they've ever been but maybe it looked different from you from your point of view because you were involved well certainly the thing that has happened which has been a very pleasant surprise up until you know uh covid were the conventions you know because the fact that there are conventions 40 years afterwards and it's it's a whole new fan base and young fans and and old fans fans that saw it you know literally 40 years ago Mm -hmm. it's really it's been it's a huge surprise it's very very cool and pleasant that you know that people are still interested and and still going and uh yeah never you know certainly when i walked out of that screening i thought i'd never hear about it again oh wow okay so even after seeing like the reaction of the people you still didn't realize that you were a part of something that would be so huge no, because I mean, certainly, even with the first part and ours, you know, we had very good um, first weekends, and um, you know, it, it it certainly made you know a nice chunk of change. But you know, you don't uh, you don't think that it's you don't think that forty years later people are going to care, and that's that's been the real pleasant surprise is that people are still interested. Staying in the same vein of just horror movies in general, uh, would you say that you have some favorites in the genre uh, besides Friday the Thirteenth? You know what? Is, uh, you know, I, I forget what is the. There's there's like a film recently with this young black actress and her on on the preview or or you know like the stills for it. Her eyes are wide open. That I forget what it's called, but it's. It, was a very good movie, and she was really extraordinary. There, um, I'm trying to think, you know, I mean, just even, uh, you know, like Amityville horror kind of films that have come out recently that, you know, thanks to COVID, been streaming, uh, you know, can stream like crazy, and because the technology has changed so much, and the fact that you can stream and see a lot of this stuff, whereas, you know, certainly when part one and part two were made, if it didn't come back to the theater, you didn't have an opportunity to see it. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And um, then fortunately, TMC picked it up and they, they've been playing it a lot on television. But even so, they would only play it 
uh, you know, like around Friday the 13th days or around Halloween because they would, you know, glom on to the uh, Halloween theme. And certainly Halloween with uh, Jimmy Curtis was a fantastic film and, and kind of kicked off the genre. You know, you just didn't have the opportunity to just go look for anything that you wanted to stream and could, you know, four o'clock in the morning, just, you know, put in the earbuds and go to town. <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. Now, do you feel, and I've heard this said, so Friday the 13th, a lot of people say is the reason for the slasher genre. Now, I know that like Texas Chainsaw and Halloween came first, but I feel like the blueprint going forward was Friday the 13th. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those guys uh, with the first film, they really plugged into uh, something. And not only that, uh, because they made part two so quickly afterwards, and they came in succession, you know, part one in 1980, part two in 1981, you know, it really kind of cemented the fan base. And not only that, but but the uh, um, you know the ability to make money, right, right. And you know nothing nothing helps success better than success. Certainly, when people were seeing that, hey, this is a genre that can be, or, or you know, certainly with horror films, you come up with a half with a decent script and a lot of good looking actors that will work for nothing because they want to get film on themselves. You find a lot of talent and um you can produce these fairly inexpensively and um it gives you a much better uh, possibility of success so did you follow the franchise moving forward after you were in part two like when three and four and all of them started coming out were you keeping up and watching just you know to support or is it something you got into maybe later i got into it m much later <laughs> you know, a lot of it had to do with the conventions. Okay. And a lot of it also had to do with the re-releases of, you know, DVDs. And this latest, I, I, you know, very fortunate that uh, I was able to uh, get this last, you know, complete box, Blu-ray box set. Mm -hmm. that, that's that been a lot of fun because not only because they've been remastered, they sound better, they look better, you know, and not only that, but all the extra stuff that they have after each film where you can, you know, get an opportunity to hear what the cast has to say or what the director has to say or what, you know, Peter Brackey has to say or, or you know, anybody that's, that's involved. It really ties the whole series together very nicely. Now, we keep talking about conventions, and I know that, you know, over the last few years, you mentioned that that became a more popular thing, and obviously you're doing appearances at them, and, and you know, basically every person who's willing from any of those movies can do these conventions. So that had to be a mind-blowing experience the first time you got a call to do one of those, and that was like, oh my God, these movies are huge today. Like, yeah. that had to be such a shock to, like, be doing appearances 40 years later almost. Well, yeah, and also the shock is that it's not only, you know, like, fans that are as old as I am. You know, it's a, it's a whole whole new generations of fans. Right. And it doesn't seem to be specific to age range. It's just... You know, different people have seen the film in different parts of their lives, mm -hmm. and it made an impression, and they're still interested in it. And that that is, that's really cool. Is there any sign of conventions uh, coming back? I know we're still in this God. pandemic, but have you heard anything about appearances that, that, you know, might be coming? Well, no, I haven't heard of anything specifically yet. But, uh, you know, 2021 is the 40-year anniversary of Part 2, and of course thought for sure that this year was going to be huge with with uh, interest in conventions yes. in part two. And also, uh, you know, in Europe, because uh, there's also a, a large fan base in Europe. And, uh, you know, because of all this, because of all this stuff, you know, no, at this point, nobody's talking about anything. I, I was able to go to, um, you know, to the, to, to the camp where part one was filmed uh last summer lauren marie and i went there for a you know social distance <laughs> a convention where you know we were in tents and everybody was six feet apart and everybody had on masks 
but that was that was in August of last year. And at that time, we thought, of course, that by the fall, it would all be gone. Yeah. And here we are, you know, a and year later. I was actually going to ask you about the, the camp experience because we had Lauren on like a month after that. And uh, she was uh-huh. telling us about it. So was that, um, I know it's it's supposed to be like a live Camp Crystal Lake. I guess it would be considered a convention almost. Um, was that your first time doing that? It was the first time at that location. Oh, okay. And and it was very small just because it was Lauren and I. And nobody else was there. And, uh, you know, even though we were able to, uh, you know, they set up a, 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 whatchamacallit, a screen at the lake and able to you know, do a, a screening of, of part one at the lake. You know, everybody, <laughs> nobody ate together, nobody partied together. <laughs> no, I, you know, it was a big difference. And in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the uh, camps that we uh, were staying at, they were the counselor camps. But instead of us all being in one, you know, one building, you know, we were, we were, very much separated so it, it, it was not the um, chummy affair that that uh, normally you know because at conventions when they're in you know either in a convention center or whatever a lot of people are staying in the hotel and you know you end up going down to the bar um after after you know the hours of the convention you know i said have drinks with the fans you know um, until uh, you know the security guards come and kick you out <laughs> right so and that is, has always been fun because uh, you know certainly the one thing that i have found which kind of surprises me is that all the fans have always been you know just extremely nice just been fantastic you know uh, it was a really had some great conversations and, and some uh, good times when, when that is, you know, socially possible. And I will say that I've always, always gone on the record saying people at horror conventions are some of the nicest people that you will ever come in contact with. I've been to a bunch of conventions myself, and everybody is always amazing. It's mind-blowing sometimes. It is. It is. I mean, who to thought? Right. <laughs> Now, there's one other movie that you worked on that I wanted to ask you about. Sure. I wanted to know what it was like working on Penn and Teller Get Killed. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, we got so killed with that. Because, I, I mean, certainly we didn't have any, you know, viruses or any of that kind of stuff. But it was it was right in the middle of the, um, uh, of the, um, the strike, you know, the screenwriter's strike. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're on set. And, uh, you know, both those guys are just as creative and funny as hell. And Arthur Penn was the director, and we had a very specific uh, script. And, uh, you know, it was like they couldn't change it. (laughs) You know, there was such an opportunity to just go wild with these guys on set, just saying, well, okay, how about if we do this? How about if we change this? How about if we say this instead? And that kind of thing. Couldn't do it. (laughs) <laughs> and I, and uh, you know, I think that you know that kind of put a damper on on the end product because it couldn't be as kind of spontaneous and and funny as those guys can be all the time. Right. So it was a little. It was a little too. Un- it was unfortunate timing for that. Okay, that's fair. So. Before I let you go, though, I do want you to um, let fans know where they can keep up with everything that you have going on for when conventions come back around or if you want to plug your social media or any websites um, or anything like that just so they can keep track and hopefully maybe things will clear up and we can get that big 40-year 40, 40 anniversary and people will be able to come out and meet yeah, you if yeah, you just want to plug your social media. Well, I, you know, certainly uh, I do have – I'm on Facebook under Bill Randolph. And, you know, anytime I'm doing anything, I post stuff on there. And that's probably the best and easiest way to find out if anything's going on as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of fans have become uh, friends. And, um, you know, it's not exclusive for Friday the 13th or, or, or horror or anything. So you will have to put up with a lot of photos of of uh, my family but, uh, <laughs> but it, whenever there's anything that's coming up like uh, i forget what it was uh, you know certainly when we did the uh, crystal lake thing 
although that was much more controlled than I knew it was in terms of people had to make reservations and it was it was not like somebody could just drive up and show up right um, right but I did I did post it you know on Facebook so at least people knew about it and put up some some pretty cool pictures from it well then my final question to you is going to be would you ever consider doing another horror movie now oh absolutely Are you kidding in a second all right. Well, I think that's a yeah. great, great way to end that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, you know, without a doubt, you know, uh, I would be. I would love to. I would let. It, I would love to see number one because the, the scripts are so interesting these days, and the effects have. Uh, you know, they're just so so cool now. To, nowadays, that um, yeah, I would. I, I'd love to get into another one. Well, excellent. You heard it here first on the All Bets Are Off podcast, so just going to throw it out there. When that happens, we're going to be like, we already knew. (laughs) (laughs) As soon as as I get cast in something, you'll be the first to know. (laughs) Perfect. Even better. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really had a good time with it. I hope you did, too, so thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. So remember, people, Bill Randolph, not Kevin Bacon. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. All right, Rockers, so that was Bill Randolph, Friday the 13th, Part 2, 40-year anniversary this year. What better way to celebrate than to have him on the show? And you guys already voted that you love this movie, number one out of the franchise, so check it out this year. Hopefully conventions will come back before the year's over, and, uh, you know, there'll be meet and greets and all that. And, of course, when that happens, we will let you guys know. You know, we were working with Nickel City Con for their convention and all that stuff, so I'm sure we'll, we'll get first dibs on that. We'll let you guys know. And we'll probably see you out there. So make sure you're keeping an eye out for that. Hope you enjoyed the interview. And as always, thank you for listening to the All Bets Are Off podcast. We will see you next time. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.